Good morning. I'm Christine Malafi from Campolo Middleton McCormick, and this is Long Island Legal. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, my guest today is Ron Beatty. Hello, Ron. How are you? Thanks for having me. You're, you're welcome. Um, Ron is um, a local business owner in Oakdale, and he is also the president of the Oakdale Chamber of Commerce, as well as the president of the Board of Trustees for the Vanderbilt Planetarium and Museum in um, Centerport. And we're lucky to have him here today. How are you? I'm doing well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Ron? Okay. Um, lifelong Long Islander. Um, moved away for, the, well, the Coast Guard moved me, me away for a few years. Um, and uh, I just wanted to get back. Um, I think I, I just mentioned to you before you didn't know that I was in showbiz when I was a kid when Guy Lombardo did the shows at Jones Beach. So I'm, I'm about all things Long Island. Very nice. And we have a, so you're a former uh, superstar, has that? I would you call me star. superstar, but uh, we had fun. It was, it was great experience when you were a kid. I think I was 10, 11, and 12 years old. Great experience. Very nice. And what, what did you do in the shows? Um, two years of Sound of Music, I played Friedrich. Um, the oldest boy, and uh, that's in the days when I could hit a high G, which I can't do anymore, uh, at least not intentionally. Um, and uh, one year, King and I. Oh, very nice. Two of my favorite plays as kids. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Very nice. Um, why don't you, um, you know, your career is so varied. You, you're a local business owner, you're involved in a lot of business entities, but you're also involved in um, a lot of charitable organizations, and you volunteer a lot. Um, how has your volunteerism played such a dominant part in your life? How did you get involved in it, and, and why does it play such a, a, a dominant part in your life? I, I like all things. I think it's the uh, having, having parents that set that example. Uh, my father was a prominent architect on Long Island, and uh, he was involved in a lot of things. Um, uh, my mother was always volunteering, and I just kind of got involved. And uh, actually, with the uh, the Chamber of Commerce, when I bought their house, which I did about uh, 23 years ago, um, it was almost like a deeded restriction that I, I had to be involved in things like the Chamber of Commerce, et cetera. Right. Giving back to the community that that makes your life such a such a nice life. And I'd like to say it's altruistic, but I think uh, there's always payback in other ways. Um, that uh, you know, you meet interesting people and uh, get involved in other business types of things uh, because you did have that uh, experience with other people in the in the volunteer world. Yes. Like I always tell my boys, do unto others, and good things yeah, happen. Absolutely. To you. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, very nice. Um, there's one. Um, board that you're on, um, Natasha's Justice Project, which as you know, uh, you, 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 yes. you, you brought me on board and I'm very grateful for that. Um, how did you get involved with that organization? Well, Natasha was a, a good friend of mine. We developed a friendship when she was executive director at um, Long Island Maritime Museum, another Suffolk County institution. And uh, she was involved, uh, we, we worked on a, on a golf outing together. and became friends with her, but obviously that's not a subject that comes up that she had been raped when uh, she was younger, she was in college. She was one of the first uh, successful prosecutions of the DNA indictment. So they uh, indict the DNA and uh, that she was actually featured in an HBO special. Um, so she started Natasha's Justice Project, which is uh, an interest. I never even knew about the rape kit backlog issue. And as you know from our work on it, um, the recidivism rate of people who uh, rape, uh, they do it again, they do other violent crimes. So it's important to test that. And, uh, and she started this, um, I guess, about two or three years ago, and I'm happy to be on the board. So she didn't have to ask me twice when, when I heard about the issue and um, and uh, I, as, as you know, her, her website is Natasha's Justice Project, so if any uh, of your viewers out there uh, want to learn more about it, it's a very interesting uh, issue. It is, and just the Natasha's Justice Project, is a, it's a not-for-profit that raises money to test old rape kits, and her story is, is so moving. She was raped. Um, and you know, when you, uh, as rape victims, when they go on in life, when there's nobody prosecuted for that, it does affect how they live their life and how they have relationships and what they think of the justice system. And she was very lucky. I, I you know, speaking with her, she got a phone call out of the blue after years from the district <coughs> attorney's Over office, 10 years, yeah. right, and said, 
you know, we know the statute of limitations is coming up. Unlike murder, there is a statute of limitations on rape. Um, and the DA's office was caring enough to make sure that they indicted the John Doe belonging to that DNA mm -hmm. that they had collected from her crime scene. And she was very surprised. And I, I, she was had made her feel good and happy that no one had forgotten that she was a victim. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, a couple of years later, they actually matched up her DNA with somebody who was in jail. Correct? And, That's and, and ironically enough, he was in jail because of jaywalking in Las Vegas. Right. It was very, it's um, very But funny. you take a criminal off the street like that years later, um, and it was successfully prosecuted, and he's in jail. Right. And, and rape, um, people who commit rape, I think it's the largest recidivism rate of any, any crime. So for every um, perpetrator that you keep in jail or put in jail, you're probably saving another Absolutely. woman from the same fate. So Absolutely. it is such a good cause, and I give her credit for as a, a, as a victim of rape to have her name out there and have everyone know her story, and it is a great and I didn't have to ask you twice, and she didn't have to yeah. ask me twice when you, when you hear about the issues. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a really rewarding oh, I think so uh, group too. to be part of. Looking forward to everything, all the work on it and, and helping, helping everybody. Um, and thank you again for bringing me on board there. Um, now, the Suffolk County Vanderbilt Museum. Yeah. I know that that's also near and dear to your heart. And Absolutely. You're president of the board there, too, which is a little bit more complicated given government involvement. <laughs> it is. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been an interesting road. I joined probably at the, at the lowest time of the Vanderbilt when uh, there was a, a, a big effort to close our doors. Um, and um, of, of course, that's exactly when I uh, got involved. So I was on the board for a couple of years, became treasurer for a couple of years. You would think being treasurer of an organization that has no money would be an easy job, but it was much more complicated than that. Um, you know, I, I have to thank the county and their foresight, especially uh, the late Bill Lindsay. Uh, he really stepped up to the plate and did everything he could to, to keep our doors open. Um, we, we now have the new $5 million projector over there. So um, again, your viewers want to go to VanderbiltMuseum.org um, and become members over there. It's uh, the, the new projector, it's $5 million, was the total uh, project. I believe the projector was three and a half or four million. Uh, the, uh, the technology is just absolutely unbelievable. We renovated the planetarium. Um, and we're, we, you know, we still have a long way to go, but we've, uh, I think we've turned the corner there. Um, and for, for a lot of reasons, the planetarium is, is definitely a big one, but we have a great board, and uh, we do have the support of the county, and, um, and I think through pu public-private partnerships, um, we'll be able to uh, improve it even more and, and to be completely independent. That's my goal. So I've been president the last three years, and um, I'm hoping that within the next two or three, uh, we'll be completely independent. That's a very good goal, and I'm sure you can put your mind to it, and, and you'll you'll accomplish that. I remember when I was at the county when the economic downturn um, really affected the endowment over there at the Vanderbilt. We were, that that was the crisis. The crisis was we were very close to the corpus, and if we hit of the endowment, if we hit the corpus. Um, it would have reverted back to the Vanderbilts. Correct, and it's a um, it's an educational uh, an educational corporation with the, filed with the state. So you have your mandates from both the Vanderbilt Trust and from the state of New York as to how you have to run the facility. And you guys have done just such a great job of bringing it back up and and helping its deteriorating condition. It's an old estate, so it has the and we the still have a lot of deterioration <laughs> that we're working on. And um, but uh, the, the fact is, is it had been called uh, the jewel of Suffolk County. And it might be a little bit tarnished right now, but we're trying to polish it where we can. And uh, the planetarium definitely helps. But, and the public-private partnerships, though, uh, I think are the way to go. Definitely. As a, my, my children, <clears throat> two young boys, and they're at the planetarium all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, with school events, and there's other events that a lot of the public may not know about, even the meeting the Easter Bunny and yep. doing the Easter egg hunt every year, yep. and the clam bake, which is coming up on Saturday. And there's lots of events there, and people should make an effort to learn about the events at the planetarium. VanderbiltMuseum.org. <laughs> Become a member. Um, 
And so another one of your volunteer organizations, um, the Chamber of Commerce in Oakdale, I know that you were involved and then you know, business takes you other places and you focus your attention to other places and you had a little hiatus there and now you're back as the president. I did have a hiatus. The hiatus really had something to do with Vanderbilt because I had just become president uh, of the Vanderbilt and, and we hadn't turned the corner yet so I knew that was going to take a lot. I also was uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer. So uh, I wasn't sure how much I could commit to the chamber back then. So I, I, I took some time off. I had been president for, I think, 10 of the last 15 years prior to that. Um, and it's something that, uh, again, my, pa my parents were founding members. Um, so it's, it's kind of been in my blood. But um, I, I had surgery, and uh, I'm well. And the Vanderbilt had surgery, and it's well, uh, or getting better at least. Um, so it, I, then, then, the the kind of the the stars have aligned in in a lot of ways um, in Oakdale, um, where we can do some of the things um, that we hadn't been able to do in the past. I I founded a group called the um, the Oakdale Planning Roundtable. Um, to be a more proactive group about not so much what we're against in terms of development in Oakdale, but more about what our vision was. And we came up with a vision plan in 2008 to create a downtown Oakdale. We never had a downtown Oakdale. Um, the reason being it was just a bunch of estates that were cut up. Uh, ironically, uh, one of the states, one of the biggest estate is now Dowling College. Um, and that was Willie K. Vanderbilt's uh, as in the center port Vanderbilt, that was his dad. So I have a lot of connections on, on both coasts here, South, <laughs> South Shore and the, and the North Shore. What uh, we did in the vision plan is we identified um, where we would want to have a downtown Oakdale, but we never had the wherewithal to make it happen. And now, as I say, there are a few things that have happened in the recent past that looks like we're going to be able to make that happen. And my father did the first uh, 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 plan, master plan for Oakdale. So I consider it a family business. So we're finally, I think, going to be able to see it come to fruition um, for a lot of reasons now. And that's why I wanted to get involved again. That's very nice. Oakdale's <coughs> a great town. And um, you I'm went a little to Dallin. prejudiced. I went to Dallin yeah. College. I sat in the Vanderbilt uh, um, home taking classes for a few years. And I love Oakdale, and it's very nice. And even and with the downtown, it's going to flourish even more. And, and I'm sure putting your mind to it, it'll get done. You're very good at that. Thank you. Um, and you're also involved in the New York Rising Project in West Sable. Oakdale, and West Oakdale. Sable. Yeah. Tell us um, a little bit about that. That was uh, a really rewarding uh, project in, in, in a couple of different ways. First of all, it was a fast track project. Um, and back in August of 2013, uh, I was approached uh, to be co-chair um, of the New York Rising. And if you're not familiar with it, <clears throat> there are some other New York Rising uh, programs. Um, ours was for community resiliency to a future storm. Um, I was fortunate to be teamed up with uh, Richard Remmer from Snapper Inn. Um, their business was significantly damaged during the storm. I was fortunate that being a quarter of a mile away from the bay, uh, the bay made, made its way six feet from my house. Oh. And that's as close as it got. But my neighbors weren't as fortunate. Um, all those people uh, in that quarter mile um, were affected. Um, Richard Remmer at Snapper Inn was affected greatly. Um, his courageous efforts, they opened up the Snapper Inn within nine days of the storm for a gal's wedding. She made up her mind that she wanted to be at Snapper Inn for her wedding. If she, this is her quote, if she had to do it in hip waders, <laughs> she was going to be married at the Snapper Inn. And they, they opened up. I was very, very fortunate to be teamed with Richard. Uh, we really, uh, we worked well and we had a great committee. So between August, um, through March is when the, the plan was. We developed a, a 14 project plan uh, for the three million dollars that we were uh, budgeted. Um, and the, the plans <clears throat> range from um, uh, physical um, protection or resiliency from storms, um, which range from waterfront um, uh, or improving our wetlands so that they're better able to um, uh, resist uh, a storm surge. 
um, all the way to raising roads, all the way to economic development. The economic development end is where we call for the downtown. So right. this is how one of the, one of the stars that are aligning to uh, to to make the uh, downtown happen for us, uh, along with uh, transportation component to it. Um, uh, it's it was really an exciting project, and at the very end of the project, we were one of eight communities. There were sixty total community reconstruction zones in the state. Um, we were one of eight that actually won bonus dollars. Uh, which doubled our money, another three million dollars of bonus dollars uh, that we can apply to our projects. Um, we were very fortunate to have uh, the, the governor's uh, insight, Governor Cuomo, who, um, who decided that it would be better to have a community committee uh, defining what our resiliency would be for our community, as opposed to it coming from Albany and them telling us what we need. Right. Um, so again, we had a very good committee, uh, I had a very good partner in Richard Remmer, um, and the three million dollars doesn't hurt, yeah. the extra. Not at all, but I think the stars aligning are in part because sometimes stars just align, but when there's someone like you who volunteers and is involved in different aspects of the community and you become involved, you can see how to pull everything together. So I think you're part of the stars. Line. You're one of the Thank stars you. that help align to make the community a better community. Uh, that's that's kind. Um, I, I thank you for that. And uh, but as I said, the the stars are also are the other community members. We had really good ta uh, town support, uh, county support through uh, County Executive Steve Ballone because now he's calling for one of the key things that we think is going to make our community more resilient is to have sewage treatment. Um, in, in an area that is one of, one of the lowest areas in Suffolk County. And as the water table rises, um, our, our cesspools are, are sitting in the groundwater. And uh, when, the, when the tide goes out, that all goes with it. Um, and it's been, uh, if you really take a look in my lifetime, one of the other things I did when I was 16, I was a clamor. The clamming industry is gone. And uh, the, the reasons are is for sewage treatment. Now, sewage treatment you can look at from an environmental standpoint um, that uh, we need to have it done. But it's also an economic development. You know, we had many businesses when I was uh, president of, of the chamber. I guess the greatest example, we had a movie theater who was interested in uh, a long dormant space in our shopping center. And we weren't able to uh, get that movie theater in because of uh, they would have to have put in their own sewage treatment plant in order to open that up. So there's a big economic uh, component, uh, economic development component to sewage treatment. And uh, I, I think in this stage of my life, if I thought that I'd be uh, a big advocate for sewage treatment uh, uh, in, in my career, I didn't think that would ever happen. But um, it's, it's one of the most significant issues that I think we can deal with in, in Long Island in general. I agree. Um, when I was at the county, we did a lot of um, agreements in putting private sewage treatment, treatment plants in place with private developers, and the, the trick for the county was to get them all connected mm -hmm. to either another sewage treatment plant or make sure they were all run operationally. And if it was if it was uniform throughout the county, you would have a lot more ability to have growth, business growth, as well as it's, it is more sanitary for people's homes. There's a lot of people, um, I know I live in Babylon, and there's a big push for sewers in Babylon to help with the economic um, development. So, um, One more thing. Um, you, have your, you have a business that I find so interesting. You, you have a business that um, helps time races. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit? It's very interesting. Another thing in my career that I never thought I'd get involved in, but I did through my brother. Um, we, uh, we time races mostly for uh, not-for-profits uh, that they use as a fundraiser. Uh, in fact, we just finished one the, on the 4th of July. It was my, my race the, uh, for the Oakdale Chamber of Commerce, the Firecracker 5K. Um, and what it is is uh, it's uh, computer RFID uh, chips and we embed them in the runners numbers and when that person finishes we know their age their gender and because generally the awards are uh, in age groups 
So we're instantaneously able to give results so that people, when they finish the race, can have a couple of drinks of water and get their awards and, and, and move on. And uh, the, the not-for-profits love it because it's, uh, there's, it's a lot of work to put on a race. Um, but uh, we've been very successful. We're in at the, the type of system that we have is, is called a Jaguar system. Uh, nationwide, we are one of the top five uh, timers in the country. Um, uh, just based on the numbers of people. We, we time over 10,000 runners a year. That's amazing. Yeah. And when people are running a race, that really is the most important thing to them. They're helping charities, they're doing it for, for health reasons, but they do want to know what was my time and what place did I come in? Exactly. So you help it, it be done instantaneous so that the not-for-profit or the, the businesses having these races, it's one less thing for them to worry about. I just exactly. thought that was very interesting. It, it's, a, it's an interesting business. My, my brother uh, had started it and um, I started helping him out because I'm more of a technology guy than he is. And, uh, and we got the new technology and now we have uh, three systems. And we're timing uh, anywhere between um, two and six races a weekend. That's very interesting. And how did your brother get into it? It's a type of, of business that I, I wouldn't picture sitting back and saying, you know, maybe I could help time races. My brother was always a competitive runner. Okay. Um, and uh, I was too, but I was a sprinter. This whole concept of running <laughs> more than one mile was, was new to me. Um, but uh, he was an avid runner and he wound up getting involved. Um, actually, when they, they used to time races back in the day, they had uh, these clips that they would actually tear off uh, part of the person's bib that had the number on it and they would have the order that people finished in and they'd have a little stopwatch and they'd record what the time was for, for that sequence. That and then, then it, it became uh, computerized uh, where you used to wear an ankle on your chip. Uh, I'm sorry, a chip on your ankle. And now we have uh, it embedded actually in the number. Very interesting. I find you've had a very um, interesting and varied career. You know, we've highlighted all of your volunteerism and making the community and the world a better place, and it's just fabulous. And I appreciate you coming on board, and we'd encourage everyone to visit the Vanderbilt Planetarium in Centerport, um, as well as get down to Oakdale and Absolutely. shop and, and visit the, the businesses. Um, and I appreciate you coming, Ron. Thanks Thank for you so me. much. Thank you, everyone. This is Long Island Legal, and we appreciate you watching.